The Bible is a story. It's a love story. It's a love story between God, the creator, who creates everything that is and sees it and says that's good, and all of who and what God creates. The Bible is a love story that spans time from the very beginning of time and before and isn't finished yet because God's great project of reconciling all of creation to God's self isn't finished yet. The Bible is a love story that has within it many, many, many smaller stories that all woven together tell us a lot about who God is and who God created us to be and how God reconciles all the brokenness in our life through the death and resurrection and ascension of his son, Jesus Christ. If we really look at the different stories that are in the Bible, we clearly see that, that there's such a wide variety of, of, of narratives and of emotions being expressed. There are stories of joy and stories of sorrow, stories of grief and stories of hope, stories of despair and stories of reconciliation. Truly, the stories that comprise the word of God tell the life of a human being. They describe what it means to live as human beings made in the image of God and yet vulnerable and fragile and broken and sinful and trying to find a way forward to abundant life in this world. The story that we just heard read today is a very, very difficult and disturbing story. It's a story about a man named Abraham who was an old man and his wife was old and used up. They had no children and God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I am going to make a great nation of you. I am going to give you descendants as numerous as the, sky, the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sands by the oceans. Impossible. Abraham and Sarah were well past childbearing age, and yet nothing is impossible with God. And so God did what God does, and sure enough, Sarah conceives a baby, and they name him Isaac, which means laughter. The greatest gift God could ever have given to this couple who were so desperate for a child, and yet were so far beyond a time when that could even be imagined. And not only that, but God promises that through Abraham and Isaac and his descendants, that God would bless every nation, every human being in this world. What a gift, right? Hallelujah, a celebration. But as time goes by, as Isaac grows, we don't know how old he, he was when this story happened. God comes back to Abraham. Now, we need to know that God and Abraham have had many interactions between the first announcement and what happens in today's story. And because they've had all these interactions together, and they've deepened their relationship, their trust between each other, their knowing of each other. God was able to come to Abraham and ask him to do something that we would consider inconceivable. God comes to Abraham and he says, I want you to take your son Isaac, your only son, the son who you love, 
the son of your old age. And I want you to take him up that mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. In that moment that we find so difficult to understand, God was trusting that Abraham would be obedient, and Abraham was trusting that God would provide. Abraham does what God says. He collects up Isaac and his servants and their animals and whatever else they needed for a journey, and off they set. And as they approach the mountain, we hear from the, the, whoever is telling us this story that Abraham and Isaac begin to have a conversation. Father, says Isaac, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And we can only imagine, we can't even imagine what is going through Abraham's heart in that moment when he really has no answer for his son, knowing that his son is to be the lamb of the sacrifice, other than to say, God will provide. It's an incredibly terrifying and difficult story. And we don't have time today to unpack it in all of its complexity, but I hope you'll join me after worship where we can do that. What I want us to think about today is what happens in this story when Abraham, who is being absolutely obedient to God, even to being prepared to sacrifice his own son, he lays him on the altar that he has built. The wood for the fire is there. Abraham takes the knife to drive it into Isaac's heart. And in that moment, in that moment, God proves who God has always been. And that is one who redeems, one who saves, one who provides. And God sends an angel who stops Abraham and says, you have proven yourself to be faithful to God. Look up, Abraham. And as Abraham looks up from his son, he sees a ram in the bushes, a ram that will become the sacrifice that fulfills the command that God had given Abraham. God depended on Abraham to be obedient, and Abraham depended on God to provide what he needed to do this thing that God was asking him to do. And both men, God's not a man, both characters in the story were faithful to who they were and what they needed to do. So this story makes me wonder, and the question I want to put out there for us to consider today is this. When have we in our own lives experienced a situation or many situations that involved a circumstance or a choice that we had to make that was so horrific and so out of our control and beyond our ability to do anything about that we just didn't know what to do? When have we been in situations that might be similar to what Abraham was confronting on that day on that mountain? Hearing God directing us in a particular direction in our lives and yet knowing the cost that following God was going to be at that time. I am sure that every one of us sitting here today can think about a time in our lives when God has commanded us or directed us or led us in a particular direction or we have found ourselves in a particular situation 
and all we could do was call upon the God who we know and love and trust to provide for us whatever we needed in that moment. I can think of two stories from my life and the life of our family. The first was 25, 30 years ago when I began to discern a call to ministry. I had a job I liked, family that was happy, everything was good. And God began to put on my heart a strong, strong call to quit my job, to leave behind everything that I knew, life as we knew it as a family, and follow God into this terrifying, terrifying call called ordained ministry. And we wrestled, Bob and I wrestled and wrestled. I wrestled with God over that one. I said, no, God said, yes. I said, no, God said, yes. I said, don't make me choose. God said, I will provide. And there was a moment in the midst of all of that turmoil and that pushing and pulling. There was a moment when I was able to look up from my own anguish and pain and see that there was a ram in the bushes. And that moment was when my husband came to me and said, I've been thinking and praying about this, and God is clearly calling you to this, and so I want you to say yes. I want you to do it. We will be okay. You have to leave the family for a period of time. We will be okay. We will do this together. That moment for me was looking up in the midst of such anguish and seeing that God provided. There was, metaphorically speaking, a ram in the bushes. The other story that comes to my mind, some of you have heard before, but you know that our son Peter was diagnosed with a very serious brain tumor when he was 18. And you walked through that with us. And as we walked through that awful journey of nine months of diagnoses and tests and preparing for a major, major brain surgery for Peter that he did not want to have, the day came when we drove him to Rochester, admitted him into the hospital, and he was called back to the room, and we said goodbye, not knowing what condition he would be in if and when we ever saw him again. And I will never forget that moment as all of you participated in a prayer, a 48-hour prayer vigil for us that we could feel, even in Rochester. There was that moment when we said goodbye to Peter and Bob and I walked out of that pre-op room into the hallway. The doctor was with us, the surgeon was with us, and all of a sudden, there it was. And I stood, well, I'm sure Bob did too, we held each other and just stood there sobbing. And the doctor said, he was a good man, he said, I'm going to treat Peter as if he's my own son. I'm going to do the very best I can for him. And he walked away. And there we stood. And suddenly there was a ram in the bushes when God placed into my heart, and I was able to share with my husband's heart, a vision, an image of Peter lying on that operating table and Jesus lying behind him with his arms around him. And that vision, that moment, told us everything we needed to know. That whether Peter lived or died, Jesus had him, that he would be okay, whether it was in this life or in the life to come. 
It's moments like those where, where we feel as if the bottom has dropped out from our very lives, that there's nothing less for us, that there is no good choice in front of us, and yet we are forced to make a choice. It's in those moments when we call upon, upon this God who is faithful and just and merciful and full of grace, this God who loves this world so much that through his son Jesus, he went to the cross because he was saying, I would rather die than have all of you continue living in the brokenness with which you live. I will make all things new. Trust me. Be obedient. Let me be your God. Be my people. And let me show you the abundant life that I created for you to have. And so I think this story invites each of us as we leave this place in a little while, to think about the story of Abraham and Isaac, to think about those moments in our own lives when we have been confronted with terrifying situations, and to remember that if we stop focusing on what is wrong and look up, God will show us everything we need to walk through that valley of the shadow of death. That God always provides a ram in the bushes. The trouble is we don't always see it. And when we are bold enough and brave enough and faithful enough to look up and let God show us that God will give us everything we need for whatever it is we are encountering, then we can take a deep breath, continue moving forward, singing, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>